Yes, this is the English version of that show we did last year. Enjoy. Right now, you're sitting in front of a PC and you're probably thinking that it's good enough. I mean, you're running a dual core or a quad core or a hexa core or hey, an octa core since Ryzen is really good. You've got enough RAM to play just about anything ever released in a video card the size of a small dog. But do you know why you have that PC? I mean, besides having bought it or your parents buying it for you, you have it because before it there came a lot of other computers, the ones that forged the future. And this is the top 7 best PCs ever made, a show dedicated to remembering the greatest achievements in personal computing ever made, the ones that paved the way for all the things we have today. That being said, let's begin with number 7, the Mets Altair 8800. If you ever want to blame someone for the rise of Microsoft, you can blame a company called Micro Instrumentation and Telemetry Systems. Also Intel because of a computer called the Mets Altair 8800. It was released in the year 1975 and it had something that most other personal computers of the time did not have such as a price that was actually acceptable, it cost only $440. Also, there really wasn't much in the way of personal computing back then, mostly because things like the Mets Altair 8800 didn't have an operating system, and to get them to do anything, you would have to program them in machine code by using the switches on it. Since it didn't have an actual keyboard or a display, you also had to assemble it yourself, it wasn't really what you'd call user friendly since at the time the user was someone either studying or teaching at Harvard. There was room for improvement like making a programming language on it, namely BASIC. And you know who offered to port it, right? Bill Gates and Paul Allen who formed Microsoft because of this. All because of this. Number 6. The ZX Spectrum It was the cheapest computer you could find on the market in 1982. It cost 125 pounds, it had a 3.5 MHz CPU, 16K of RAM, it had BASIC, you could add a cassette player to it to load programs and most of all you could play games on it. A lot of games. It was made by Sing Claire Research and sold over 5 million units, even getting its creator, Clive Sinclair, a knighthood. But not because of the sales, but because this computer is responsible for Europeans having access to affordable PCs. They may not have had the highest production value, but it was so popular that not only are people still producing games for it, and I mean now in the present 2017, but it had about 60 clones. That means people made copies of it at a hardware level and then sold them under other names in regions where the Spectrum wasn't available. For those of you living in Romania, that's how the Felix HC was born, one of the greatest computers ever made in this country. Also, one of the only ones made around here. There was also the Tim S, the Cobra, the Chip 03, and the Jet. And unlike all phones and tablets sold by Romanian companies, these computers were actually made here, not bought in bulk from China and had a logo slap on them. The locals will get it, but you can all view it. Now that's something that only the locals will truly get. Number 5. The Commodore 64 Released at about the same time as the ZX Spectrum, this was the most successful computer made by the Commodore International Company and also the most successful computer ever made. And by that, I mean the kind of computer that wasn't what we have now. At the time, it cost around $600, it had 64K of RAM, the ability to output 16 color graphics and was being constantly sold over the course of 21 years. Yes, for that long. Do you believe that your Q6600 is still going to work for the next 12 years? Well, yes, it probably will and by how slow the horror development is today, it'll probably still be an okay CPU, but you can't buy a new one anymore. The Commodore 64, however, was such a huge success that it dwarfed just about everything else. And in hindsight, 
that may not have been such a good thing. It received numerous hardware revisions, improvements, and a large amount of software, including games that are still being made right now, like right now. There's a Kickstarter for one. And it had the kind of software you couldn't really get on other platforms. This was where you could find things like Habitat, one of the first true interactive online worlds, a predecessor to MMOs and games like Second Life, and you may have even seen a fictional version of it in the third season of Halt and Catch Fire. The first season was better. Number 4. The Apple II. Regardless of what you may believe of Apple as it is now, 40 years ago it was an entirely different company. Riding the high interest in the Apple I, the first computer built by hand by the legendary Steve Wozniak, the Apple II was the system that made Apple what it is. Wozniak designed every bit of it. Again, at one time completely rebuilding a circuit board just so he could make a revision that had five mounting holes instead of eight, a process that took him eight weeks. It may have cost almost $1,300, but at the time this was something really innovative. This was a system that came with a monitor, with floppies, an operating system and all sorts of other things, and every person could buy one. Sure, it may have had just a 1 MHz processor and 4K of RAM, but this was was where home computing flourished. You could use it for work, you could use it for play, you could actually use it to make games. Most game series you know from back in the day like Ultima, Bard's Tale, Might and Magic, Wizardry and Prince of Persia exist because of this machine, because people were interested enough in creating new things on it that they worked hard and made the wonders that shaped gaming as we know it. It sold millions of units and was responsible for an entire generation of people wanting to work with computers, with technology. It gave us a vision of the future and it… well, you probably wouldn't have guessed that Apple would have turned into a creatively bankrupt company like it is now. Sure it seemed like it was heading in a different direction back then. Number 3. The Xerox Alto. You may not know this, but the reason PCs exist like they are today is because of Xerox, a company that fostered and nurtured creativity and then didn't really do much with it. Had Xerox patented everything they made or enforced their creations, today's technology landscape would be wildly different. Had they even sold something, marketed something, oh boy would we live in a different world. And all because of the Xerox Alto. It was made in the year 1973. It cost a bundle and was never released to the public. It was designed mostly for companies, governments and so on, but it was still a PC. It didn't need a mainframe to work, it was small, it was compact and it was capable of doing amazing things. It had Ethernet and email support back when the internet wasn't the thing that existed. You could play the earliest possible multiplayer FPS on it called Maze War. The Xerox Alto was the first to have a mouse with three buttons. Back when there was no such thing as a home computer let alone a mouse with any kind of other number of buttons. In fact, the only thing out at the time that could be considered electronic entertainment was the Magnavox Odyssey. That's the only competition it would have had in the home as an entertainment system in the gaming computer sense. The Alto had 128k of RAM going sometimes all the way up to 512k. It had a keyboard. It had a gigantic display with a resolution of 606 by 808 and the graphical user interface with the first implementation of the desktop as we know it. A graphical interface with windows, with menus, before even MS-DOS existed. And you're wondering what kind of CPU it had? Well, it didn't actually have one in the sense that you know it today. Sadly, Xerox realized what wonder it had on its hands only about 8 years later when it released a version for the general public. 
after absolutely everyone else stole their design and even hired the people that were working on it because hey Xerox didn't want to do anything with it. It's like the people that invested in electric typewriters because the computers were never gonna be a thing. It's like the people that wanted faster horses. A company's lack of foresight doomed an entire system. Had things gone differently computing may have been accelerated by five years. Imagine computers starting out with a graphical interface. How much better would have things been? Much, much better. Number two, the IBM Personal Computer Model 5150. The personal computer world changed in the year 1981. IBM, one of the companies that built supercomputers and terminals used by just about everyone, released its first personal computer, the IBM Personal Computer Model 5150. 150. Every computer made today is a descendant of it. It's a direct copy of its architecture. It was released for around the price of $1,500. So it may not have been cheap, but it was a great machine. It had an Intel 8088 CPU, one of the first x86 CPUs out there. It had 16K of RAM and it had the entire weight of IBM behind it. It was quickly adopted as a new standard, most tech companies trying their best to make IBM compatible personal computers which we still use today. It's because of this machine and its success that AMD started to copy Intel's architecture and make its own x86 CPUs, because programs were written for its instruction set and for one operating system, DOS. While Microsoft may have gotten its start with the Altair, this is where it became a juggernaut. IBM had a choice of either offering the 5150 with Microsoft's quick and dirty operating operating system, later renamed PC-DOS and MS-DOS, or to use CPM, a different operating system with similar capabilities, but with some benefits like a primitive form of multitasking. The reason these two were similar is because Microsoft sort of ripped off parts of CPM, so there really wasn't much of a difference for IBM. Gary Kildall, the creator of CPM, decided to not sue anyone and he asked IBM to sell the model 5150 with both operating systems and let the market decide which was best. But IBM sort of did something, which in hindsight was an awful idea. It sold CPM at about 10 times the price of DOS. So basically, not a lot of people bought CPM and Microsoft became a major software company, eventually driving even IBM out of the market years later. Now, why did IBM do this, you may ask? Well, <laughs> That sure is a mystery. It's almost as if the deck was stacked since the get-go against Gary Kildall's CPM. IBM lost control of the hardware company not long after the Model 5150, being beaten to the market in the 32-bit CPU race by Compaq, which launched a computer using the Intel 386 CPU. But the legacy remained, and now we all use IBM-compatible computers, for the most part with Microsoft Windows in it, not CPM or GEM. And the number one greatest computer ever made is the Commodore Amiga. Had history gone a different route, we'd now probably be still using Amiga computers. After the Commodore 64 took off, the company found a successor for it, a computer like no other, with enough power to give the end user all the tools they need to do, well, anything. The Commodore Amiga 1000 cost $1000 in 1985, but it was a monster in terms of performance and capability. This was a machine that could display up to 4000 colors, pump out two channels worth of stereo audio, render 3D graphics, display play full motion video and sometimes with all at the same time. It had multitasking in a time when most systems couldn't even handle two processes at the same time, let alone more of them. It could play games that looked better and ran better than anything else ever made. You had almost arcade quality here. It gave every user the ability to produce art, be it drawn, audio or movies, like no other machine could. The software it had was 
was peerless in the sense that there wasn't anything comparable out on the market. It was a masterpiece a decade ahead of its competition and yet it had a problem. Commodore. The 64 was a great success for the company, so much that most of the executives decided to not really care about developing things further they had made untold millions already. So instead of investing that money into the Amiga and developing it further, they actually fired the whole research and development staff. And while the Amiga was the most advanced machine of its time, the marketing portion of Commodore had no idea how to sell it. And it sort of uh, got direction from leadership that was, well, I wouldn't say bad, but imagine if the captain of the Titanic was running a hardware company. Oh sure, they still made millions with their severance packages but hey they still screwed up one of the greatest machines ever made so instead of taking the world by storm and change it forever the Commodore Amiga burned brightly in the night and then faded had it not, today a Windows machine wouldn't be your only real option. An Intel or AMD CPU wouldn't be your only choices for a processor. More so, we would have probably had games like Doom years earlier, games like Ultima Underworld, games like System Shock and Elder Scrolls. But we didn't. We don't. Because even if it was the best PC ever made, the morons running the industry drove it into the ground. Just like they're doing now. These were the best PCs ever made. And if you're wondering, well where's the alien where my daddy bought me for $4,000 with two Titan XP's? It's the greatest bestest thing ever made. Well feel free to take that alien where and do something unspeakable with it. Like learn about the history of computers.